Good evening and a warm welcome to everyone to the Library of the Institute for Human Sciences here in Vienna. We are live streaming this around the globe, the blue planet floating in cosmos. And uh, a warm welcome to all of those who have joined us here this evening. It gives me a great pleasure and honor to uh, host this evening and to moderate the conversation that we will have afterwards with uh, Slobodan Markovic. I'd like to briefly introduce him, and then uh, Slobodan will give his talk. There's a PowerPoint as well, and then we'll have hopefully a, a very good discussion. And last but not least, in our tradition, we will have wine and cheese downstairs later on for those of you who are physically present. Fortunately, we can't share that online. Um, so, Slobodan Markovic, uh, full disclosure, we've known each other for at least 20, if not more years, uh, is a full professor at the School of Political Science of the University of Belgrade, where he lectures on political and cultural anthropology, political history of Southeastern Europe, and the image of the European other. He did his MPhil in historical studies at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom, and then his PhD in political anthropology at the University of Belgrade. He has been a research associate at the Center for Southeast European Studies at the London School of Economics, and also of LSE Ideas since 2018. He has been the head of the Center for British Studies at the School of Political Science in Belgrade since 2017. Notably, in 2014, he was decorated by Queen Elizabeth II, and he has an MBE, or a member of the Order of the British Empire, for the promotion of British-Serbian cultural and educational links. Among his numerous publications is his book on Freud's pessimism. That's the one you see there that I'm proud to possess. Uh, also, a number of edited collections of papers in English that include British-Serbian relations from the 18th to the present century, problems of identities in the Balkans, and challenges to new democracies in the Balkans. He has been the coordinator of biannual meetings of the Psychoanalysis and Culture Group since 2016 and has co-edited three collections of these conferences. He uh, today will be speaking uh, from a new book that he is preparing. The theme is psychoanalysis between its universal aspirations and Eurocentric limitations. I think we're in for a very exciting presentation and a great discussion afterwards. So, Slobodan, welcome. And uh, of course, Slobodan is a senior fellow here at the Institute for these three months, and we're very proud to have you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ivan. Yes, we have known each other for actually 25 years. <laughs> Time goes very quickly. Allow me uh, at the beginning to cordially thank the Institute for Human Sciences, IVM, for this remarkable opportunity to be Krzysztof Michalski Fellow at IVM. At this institution, which a friend of mine, a former fellow, called an academic paradise, uh, working on psychoanalytic anthropology in the city of Sigmund Freud and at the institute which is located just several hundred meters from the library of Sigmund Freud, the biggest of that kind in the world, is really an unusual and special opportunity for which one must feel greatly indebted. Uh, when I should say something about Krzysztof Michalski, I'll feel compelled because uh, I have the fellowship which bears his name and how his work is in a kind of several ways connected to what I will be speaking today. When Krzysztof Michalski founded the Institute in 1982, he had in mind above all connecting intellectuals from Central Europe with intellectuals from Western Europe. And there is a curious link between today's lecture and Michalski's ambition. Both anthropology and psychoanalytic anthropology were actually among the first disciplines who did exactly that task, who linked Central Europe with Western Europe, 
the father of social anthropology and actually the creator of ethnographic method, Bronislaw Malinowski, was actually born in Austria-Hungary in Krakow, Krakow. And he had special relations with psychoanalysis that oscillated between adoration and contempt. He very early realized that he had himself the Oedipus complex, uh, but then later he was not sure about the universality of psychoanalysis, and, and he was among the last persons who visited Sigmund Freud in London, and when he called to be received, he wrote that he was a great admirer of Sigmund Freud in 1939. Uh, the two founders of psychoanalytic anthropology, Geza Roheim and George Devereux, whose original name was George Dobo, they were both born in, Austria, in the Habsburg Empire, actually in the Kingdom of Hungary. And um, psychoanalytic anthropology as such as a subdiscipline was formulated by Geza Roheim in Budapest in 1915 while the monarchy still existed. In other words, I will be talking here about uh, another but earlier encounter of Central and Western Europe. I would like also to mention that Paul Robinson, the author of the book entitled The Freudian Left, claimed in 1969 the following. It could be argued that psychoanalysis provided Hungarian thinkers with one of the, their most important means of access to the Western European intellectual community. And it, of course, is reflected in psychoanalytic anthropology as well. The other thing that connects today's lecture with Michalski's work is Friedrich Nietzsche, on whom Michalski wrote his famous monograph, The Flame of Eternity. In making what could be called the Freudian Revolution, the father of psychoanalysis occasionally quoted Nietzsche in an adapted form. He actually was speaking about Umwertung aller psychischen Werte, re-evaluation, re transvaluation of uh, all psychic values rather than transvaluation of all values, as Nietzsche did. So, the spirit of Michalski and his commitment to the cooperation of Central and Western Europe will, I hope, be clearly voiced in my presentation. And now that Central Europe has, to a large degree, already achieved what Michalski had in mind, it's already, to a very large degree, a part of uh, Western European <coughs> mainstream. In addition to this, I hope that I will be able to address another priority of EVM, uh, which is the need for understanding and cooperation between Europe and the Global South, and that will be addressed in the last part of my lecture today. So I will basically first say something about Sigmund Freud and why he's so important, then about uh, psychoanalytic anthropology, and finally, in the third part, on the encounter of psychoanalytic anthropology and post-colonial thinkers. I will now need to move here, if I'm allowed. Thank you. So, as I have mentioned, I will first say something about Sigmund Freud as sexologist, psychoanalyst, armchair anthropologist, and cultural critic. The first thing that I need to mention is sexology. As someone who deals with um, intellectual history, I think it's always very important to place properly historical uh, personalities, great thinkers, within settings of their own time. Unless we do it, we may have uh, problems in decoding what they really said. So what happened during the 19th century especially during its second half, was that Victorian repressive sexual morality prevailed throughout bourgeois Europe, and then through European imperialism and cultural transfer, it had a global impact. And what we today call uh, the hegemonic masculinity, 
uh, the climax of actually this hegemonic militarized masculinity happened in the period between 1860 and 1945. Here is one of the authors, Prof. Professor Schmale, who wrote about it. And if you look the years of that climax, you will see that a, they almost totally overlap with the life of Sigmund Freud. It's not only that he lived during the era of hegemonic masculinity, he lived when this concept reached its climax. And therefore, to say that um, Sigmund Freud's theory contain phallocentric concepts, uh, of course, they do. There is no doubt. No one can escape from his or her own zeitgeist, and so couldn't Freud. Uh, but it only means to explain in what kind of world he lived, it doesn't mean that the validity of his ideas is greatly changed by that fact. Stefan Zweig, who uh, went to a nearby gymnasium at Wasagasse, he famously said in his World of Yesterday, but this fear of everything physical and natural dominated the whole people, from the highest to the lowest, with the violence of an actual neurosis describing Vienna of his youth, describing the end of about 1900, the Vienna in which Sigmund Freud wrote his most famous uh, pieces. Or as Wolfgang Schmale put it, describing this concept of hegemonic masculinity, everything, everything indeed, ideational, material, body-related, moral, habitual, turns into sexual deconomy and is asymmetrically marked by superior masculinity. Sigmund Freud lived in an era like that, and he, of course, couldn't have escaped uh, that burden. Uh, what is his significance? Uh, what did American biographers tell us about him? And I always insist on American bio biographers. It's simply that most of his biographers, with the exception of early ones like Fritz Wittels and uh, Stefan Zweig, who was more like a literary biographer, and with the single exception of uh, Ernest Jones, they are all, almost all of them, Americans. The reason is very simple. His daughter, Anna Freud, actually gave his huge correspondence to the Congress Library, so it's much easier for them, for American historians, to do Freud, strangely enough, than to European historians. Peter Gay, uh, who wrote about a dozen of books that contained the word Freud in their title, uh, said in, an in, 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 a, in a piece for time, for good or ill, Sigmund Freud, more than any other explorer of the psyche, has shaped the mind of the 20th century. And the recent biographer, George Macari, um, also an author of the history of xenophobia, uh, noticed the following, psychoanalysis emerged from the rubble of post-war Europe, meaning World War II Europe, as the leading modern theory of the mind, its model of unconscious passions, its notions of defense and inner conflict, and its methods on unraveling self-deception, encroached upon traditional sources of self-understanding like religion. In the US, psychoanalysis made its way into the court, schools, and hospitals, and informed literature, cinema, television, journalism, theater, and art that much about the influence of psychoanalysis. BBC has a series that is available on YouTube called The Century of the Self, which actually depicts how psychoanalytic notions changed our complete understanding of the world we live in and how they had a peculiar twist in America. I will refer to it later. It's called Americanization of Psychoanalysis, not really the best episode in psychoanalytic history but also by, through the mediation of Freud's nephew, who in a very strange way adopted psychoanalysis for PR purposes, Edward Bernays, or Bernays, that nice, of course, in German, but Bernays or Bernays in English. Uh, it, it actually very much shaped American cultural history and even American political history. And, uh, uh, that, that is the topic of, the, of this uh, documentary. It only testifies how important psychoanalysis was. So what were these great discoveries that Freud has made? First of all, he said in the interpre Interpretation of Dreams, and that's the book that Talcott Parsons, one of the greatest American sociologists, 
termed as a very great work, work that opens the 20th century, he said. His daughter was also a psychoanalyst, Anna Parsons. So Sigmund Freud claimed that dreams reveal what human, humans really desire. What follows from that is that sexual fantasies in dreams represent human deepest wishes. Humors are deeply ambivalent. They can hate and love the same object, mother, father, or whoever else. What they hate manifestly, they can love latently and the other way around. Repression of sexuality leads to neurosis. Humans are creatures of unfulfilled desires. And sexuality and libido are in humans from day one till their death. Very different to the Victorian understanding that kids were angels. His life was very unlike his theories. Uh, he was very conventional. His uh, first biographer, first Anglo-Canadian biographer, uh, called him Puritan. And uh, his Viennese biographer, Fritz Wittels, claimed that Viennese cafes proclaimed an imminent revolution in our sexual mores of which Freud strictly conventional his private life would have preferred to hear as little as possible. But Freud was not only the father of psychoanalysis, he was also very much interested in anthropology, in archaeology. And in 1913, he published his seminal work in the field of anthropology, Totem and Taboo, which marks an unfortunate beginning of psychoanalytic anthropology. To say that he was an armchair anthropologist is, of course, not a, a kind of objection. Most of the anthropologists of that age were armchair anthropologists. What did he say in this book? And we should be aware that anthropological concepts were not re really very developed in 1913, and that what I called the beginning of social anthropology and the ethnographic method connected to Malinowski, this happened since the 1920s, so after this book has been, uh, was written. Freud claimed in this book that two basic laws of totemism were not to kill the totem animal and to avoid sexual intercourse with members of the totem clan of the opposite sex. He noticed something. He noticed that in many traditional societies, totem was the primal father and from that, he concluded that two basic laws of totemism coincide in their content with the crimes of Oedipus, who killed his father and married his mother, as well as the, with the two primal wishes of children. Freud basically believed that in early stages of human society, and in his interpretation, it's eo tempore. We don't know when it is. It's eo tempore. He didn't know when it is, and a chronology, of course, that we have today was far from existing in 1913. So uh, he basically claimed that humans lived in original hordes, and in these hordes, and let us be reminded this is the climax of hegemonic masculinity, there was a very potent, powerful father who was a tyrant who tortured his children, and his children, of course, at some point decided to rebel. And this is where Freud leads us to his storytelling, which goes approximately like this, but that represents the core of his own version of psycholytic, psychoanalytic anthropology. So what Freud says in his story, one day the brothers, these brothers who were tormented by their tyrant father, who had been driven out, they came together. They killed and devoured their father, and so made an end to the patriarchal horde. Cannibal savages as they were, it goes without saying that they devoured their victim as well as killing him. The totem will, which is perhaps mankind's earliest festival, oral restrictions and of religion. In other words, the murder of the primal father is the beginning of human morality, human religion, human culture. Not a very good uh, definition of what in, back in 1913 and even today is held as uh, the highest uh, <coughs> expressions of human culture.
Later, of course, he realized that this couldn't work. Okay, even if this happened at some place, how did it diffuse around the world? So he later, in Moses and Monotheism, his last book, claimed that this was something repetitive, repetitive pattern. It didn't happen once, it happens on many occasions, and that's how it was interiorized. But the problem is that anthropologists from this moment, from 1913, knew Freud by this book. There was something very unfortunate about it. And the unfortunate was the uh, exact historical setting of how the book was created. Freud faced the rebellion of Carl Gustav Jung, who he was preparing to be his successor. That was a huge problem for Freud, something that, of course, had its history of at least four years. And now we are very much tempted to rethink what happened, what he constructed as a story, that it was a kind of defense mechanism from his own life. So not to have the same destiny like the primal father by his disciples, not to be eaten by them and cut into pieces. He established something called the secret committee and to his most loyal associates, he gave a ring, you see those rings, with an intaglio, very valuable rings, these are ancient artifacts there, and he made them members of the secret committee. Why is this important? Freud was a man who corresponded a lot, about 20,000. It is estimated he wrote about 20,000 letters, of which 10,000 have been preserved. So he was in constant communication with everyone, and he actually valued their opinion. But these people, who were just elevated to the level of uh, knights, symbolically speaking, and who just became Freud's adopted sons, as Phyllis Grosskort called them, they were not really in a position to tell him anything, except eulogies for his great book. So uh, rather than telling him, look at this or that side of the story, they even made him uh, more convinced that what he said in Totem and Tabu was absolutely correct. And this makes this unfortunate beginning of the psycholytic anthropology, which will actually make huge limitations to the whole discipline for about next 50 years. <coughs> in addition, Freud, as the museum insists, as the museum insists on quite correctly, was tabu brahe, or breaker of taboos. And what are the taboos that he broke of the Victorian society? And when we say Victorian society, we don't mean society of Queen Victoria, but any society in Europe and America uh, of the late 19th century. First of all, he established the children possess elaborate sexuality, that they hate their parents in some developmental stages. That was a huge shock. Human sexuality is originally perversive and has bisexual basis. I will return to that later. Marriage does not necessarily cure. It often reinforces the neurosis, he said, already in 1908. And there was the psychological blow to human narcissism, which you can see in this illustration by Oscar Zarate from Freud for Beginners. So there is a poor ego, this little man, who is surrounded by the unconscious id, who is surrounded by superego, who is surrounded by external reality, or as Freud said, in his article for the journal Nugat in Budapest in 1917, the ego is not master in its own home. Rationality does not really run humans. The next issue is that hypermorality is hyper illness, so the more moral we are, the more ill we are, because the more repressed we are. And culture is illness that's his topic from Das Unbehagen in their Kultur, civilization is discontent. And finally, religion is a universal obsessional neurosis of humanity, something that he touched in Totem and Tabu, but something that he developed in Die Zukunft einer Illusion, the future of an illusion, 1927. 
of course, psychoanalysts could be the group that could cure the curses of humanity that psychoanalysis have detected, but he was never quite clear if that was only for selected few or for the whole humanity. And in that sense, he resembled really Saint Augustine, who also believed that God would save lucky few without any reason, because even those lucky few should have end up in the hell. But uh, the rest would be massa damnata. So rather than having massa damnata, in Freud's interpretation, we have massa neurotica. And here we come to the main issue of today's uh, lecture, and that is these things that Freud developed under those settings of hegemonic masculinity, Vienna, uh, with patients who were from middle class and upper middle class, educated. Do they tell us something about universal human nature, or do they tell us more about how Viennese neurotic person looked like in about 1900 or in about 1920, or how Freud looked like because he was his own first patient. And this is the big, to go back to the beginnings of the Institute, this is a huge debate between Central Europe and Western Europe in which Malinowski, Geza Roheim, Sigmund Freud, and Ernest Jones participate. In 1924, the most mocked defender of Freudian orthodoxy, Ernest Jones, his later biographer, admitted that psychoanalysis was based on only a few thousand cases, but he said certain features warrant the expectations that they do not differ from the rest of mankind in fundamental structure, particularly since investigations were done with the general uniformity of result in many countries of every continent among widely differing races and by very different type of observer. The problem is that the father of social anthropology did not agree, and Bronislaw Malinowski, who did his surveys among Trabrianders, already in 1923 expressed some doubts and he claimed basically that there was no Oedipus complex that is supposed to be universal in Freudian theory among Trabrianders. There was rather a vancular complex. There was no powerful father, but actually rather there was an uncle who replaced father in that society. And this opened up a debate which is still open. Is there, how much are the concepts of uh, psychoanalysis, universal, and how much are there only uh, European or Viennese or whatever. And what is here is stake, what here is at stake is something very, very big. It's the very concept of human nature. David Hume famously said in 1748 in an inquiry concerning human understanding that there is a great uniformity among the actions of man in all nations and ages, and that human nature remains still the same in its principles and operations. The same motives always produce the same actions. This is nothing new. Uh, the emperor who died here in Vindabona, Marcus Aurelius, says in Meditationes that basically uh, actors can change. There will be Marcus in one generation and Gaius in the other, but uh, they play the same roles, just they're different actors. So this is this idea that human nature, some sort of essential human nature exists. And we finally come to anthropology and psychoanalysis. And the problem is that when Freud wrote this book, and when it started to get reception in the United States, another school began to emerge, cultural and personality school. And that school is very much connected to Margaret Mead, the first lady of American intelligentsia, maybe not that famous now, but very famous 50 years or 60 years ago, 
one of the forerunners of the American sexual revolution, and what she basically claimed was that there was plasticity of human nature. Every culture is so different, and it's so differently shaped by local circumstances that perhaps we cannot speak at all about human nature. Even what we would see as abnormal is very relative. There was no abnormal, there was something only special. Of course, Margaret Mead had also personal reasons to be engaged in all of this. I will come back soon to it. But she expressed it most clearly in Coming of Age in Samoa, the book from 1928, which, was, which really, in a way, heralded sexual revolution after the Second World War. It has subtitle which explains motives behind it. A psychological study of primitive youth for Western civilization. So she's writing that to address Puritanic morality, another name for Victorian morality, but in the United States. And her main claim is growing up is not a difficult task. It is a culturally relative issue. Growing up is a difficult task in American Puritanic society. It's not a difficult task in Samoa. American version is just one of the versions, but we have others. Let's try something with them. And this played a huge role in sexual liberalization and led to it and to hybridity. By the time her interpretation and the lack of field method were severely challenged, which happened in the 1980s, when it was discovered that actually informants with whom she spoke were making jokes with her. Her cultural relativism had already been widely accepted. Mead, however, belonged herself to cultural mainstream. She even participated in the reform of Anglican prayer book. She was a member of the Episcopalian Church, officially had three marriages, but unofficially had two same-sex relations. She never even gave a hint about her ambisexuality, bisexuality, not even in her autobiography, which is totally understandable because it was still a criminal act in all American federal states. But not everyone agreed with this cultural relativism. And some people quickly realized that something very great was here at stake. And among them was Erich Fromm, another disciple of Sigmund Freud, who, however, became increasingly disillusioned with Freud, with this secret committee that I mentioned, uh, with Freud's hidden political ambitions, with, and above all, with Freud's instinctivism, which I will not touch today. So, in a book published in 1968, it's a collection of texts by him and Raman Zero, The Nature of Man. He points out that the study of the so-called primitive peoples, just be aware that all these authors use primitive, savage, etc. That was normal uh, for, for anthropology 50, 60 and more years ago. We would say native, traditional, <coughs> aboriginal, but I cannot change. Uh, texts under qu quotation marks. So the study of the so-called primitive peoples has shown such a diversity of customs, claims from, values, feelings, and thoughts, that many anthropologists arrived at the concept that man is born as a blank sheet of paper on which each culture writes its text. And now he asks, is it necessary to come to the conclusion that there is no human nature, as cultural relativists did? Such an assumption claims from seems to imply as many dangers as those inherent in the concept of a fixed nature. If there were no essence common to all men, it may be argued there could be no unity of man. There could be no value or norms valid for all men, which many postmodernists actually claim. There could not even be the science of psychology or anthropology, which has at its subject matter man, and which is the subject matter of the name of this institute as well. Let us be reminded from mention. So now 
psychoanalytic anthropologists finally, they appear, and the first one is Gezer Rohheim, the first psychoanalytic anthropologist who actually defined the discipline in 1915 in Budapest. He was a geographer, ethnographer, folklorist. As I already mentioned, psychoanalysis was one of very important outlets for Hungarians to communicate with Europe. And uh, he was analyzed by Sandor Ferenczi. So after this original, Sandor Ferenczi was, by the way, another member of the secret committee. Uh, and the most uh, loyal Freud's disciple. So after this discussion, 1923, 1927 in Malinowski, a need appeared. Someone should be sent to do field work, but someone who is psychoanalytically trained and to see if these concepts that Freud and others made work or do not work in other cultures, under quotation marks, primitive cultures. So special double number of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis in 1932 was dedicated to Roheim's Psychoanalysis of Primitive Cultural Types, was published both in German and in English. And what Roheim did, he got stipend from Princess Marie Bonaparte, and he went to Africa, he went to Australia because it was believed at that time, and perhaps it's not too wrong even today could be claimed that ab aborigines of Australia reflected some of the oldest manners still preserved among uh, human groups, still extant human groups. And then he went to Melanesia and then among Yuma Indians in Arizona. Ernest Jones was super satisfied, he said. Everything was confirmed, everything that Frank claimed was confirmed, this is a great event. But the problem was that Roheim, although he realized even during this trip that totem and tabu and uh, the primal patricide did not really work well, he insisted for some time that it worked and then gradually, very gradually abandoned the idea. And this very idea alienated many anthropologists even those who were psychoanalytically trained. It is not very widely known, but Alfred Kreber, one of the greatest American anthropologists of that age, was psychoanalyst. He had an office, psychoanalytical office, next to his office, expecting patients till the end of his life, but no patients ever appeared. But nonetheless, he had license to do that. Margaret Mead was also very much uh, affirmative about psychoanalysis originally. And at least she read very carefully Rochheim and occasionally quoted him. But others were very, very skeptical of these claims. And actually, this ins insistence on literar literary uh, ad verbatim interpretations of totem and tabu created, uh, actually, or reinforced already negative stereotypes about Freudian anthropology. Of course, Roheim, I will, ask, I will need to ask Kasper to help me with uh, this. Of course, Roheim had a conclusion which was very much in line with uh, what psychoanalysis he had claimed before. So he said, if we admitted the validity of psychoanalysis in Europe, we must believe a priori that as a method of investigation, thank you very much indeed, it is at least applicable to the individual savage. Of course, in this statement, the fundamental psychological unity of mankind is taken for granted. On the other hand, he was also very much open to acknowledge the existence of ambisexuality, bisexuality, something that after Freud was a kind of taboo in psychoanalytic movement, as you will soon see. But he also accepted Freud's radical cultural pessimism, 
and even deepened it further. He considered that functionalists were justified to focus on cultural difference, but it was also reasonable to pursue the study of the universals. Since humans share biological and instinctual traits, since they confront similar environmental problems, and they all experience something of key importance for psychoanalysis, a prolonged period of in infantile dependence, then psychoanalysts are justified also to speak about human nature. Rockheim had encyclopedic knowledge. He was probably the man in the history of uh, intellectual history of Europe that had the greatest collection and the greatest knowledge of folkloristics. But as Alan Dundas, one of the greatest folklorists, admitted in this collection published many decades after Roheim's death, for the history of folkloristics, it is as though Roheim or Freud, for that matter, never lived. So not a huge influence. Also very small influence of American anthropology and no influence on British. One of the reasons is that he was a polymath and an erudite. So he was taking in many of his books and articles for granted that readers would know everything he knew. And it's difficult to read some of his writings for that reason. It was only thanks to Var uh, Warner Minsterberger, a famous New York psychoanalyst, famous among Hollywood actors at least, that his legacy was kept. It was kept to biennial publications, Psychoanalysis and the Social Sciences, and Psychoanalytic Study of Society. But if I tell you that not even the library of Sigmund Freud has the full set of these volumes, it will tell you that uh, didn't really make quite a huge impact. Fortunately, things did change for psychoanalytic anthropology with George Devereaux, who made another version of psychoanalytic anthropology called ethnopsychiatry. He was the man who changed name and religion twice, who engaged in five disciplines and was very, very prominent in four of them, and had many marriages. So he was born in Romanian, what is today Romanian Banat, but he went to Paris, started to study physics, then became student of Marcel Moss and became anthropologist, then moved to the United States and started to do research among Mojave Indians, Indians who, in whose culture dreams play a very huge role. And then he became research director in the Winter Veterans Hospital with psychoanalyst Carl Manninger. Carl Manninger was a very open-minded psychoanalyst, not all of post-World War II psychoanalysts were of that kind. And um, in the foreword of one of uh, Devereux's books, he says, which is actually dedicated to psychoanalyzing a plain Indian, he says that it took 150 years for the Brits to realize that infants should not be used to clean chimneys. Basically, they were sacrificing infants that way. And it took another 150 years for Americans to realize that Indians had feelings. And he said that Americans could be pardoned for that only one-tenth of a percent. So only 0.1%. 99.9% Americans are guilty for what they did to Indians. And then he says, is Devereaux a naturalized American, who of course in France, that second name was Georges, and in America became George. Is he apt to do it? Because as naturalized American, but also conscientious American, he must feel guilt for what America did to Indians. And then he says, yes, he is, because he's aware of that. And this is very important, because this, what Menninger told him, led him to a very huge discovery, which I will soon uh, deal with. Among other things, Devereaux concluded that a neurotic or psychotic from a native society, 
resembles more an American neurotic or psychotic than a normal member of a native society resembles a normal American. Thinking about his experience with Mojave Indians, by the way, the only, the only society where he felt at home, and you should be aware that all those psychoanalytic anthropologists were in quest of their own identity. They had very fluid, very complicated, very complex identities. So, George Devere was born a Jew in Austria-Hungary, then became Roman Catholic in Paris, and then went further with his identities. So he concluded in this very important book, From Anxiety to Method, which is now being very carefully read again, that scholars are not different from other humans. They have their own anxieties and their own fantasies. And those anxieties and fantasies influence every single scholar. The unconscious works all the time and influences scientific works. Science data also arouse anxieties, and scientists must not try to elevate them, but to understand what they mean. And he came to that from this Manninger's warning, could you as a guilty American deal with Indians? So for instance, although he didn't do only with Mojave, he did he did with another native society. He didn't write about the other native society because he detected in himself huge anxiety for, the, for this other culture. There is also a perceptual relativism that the researcher needs to acknowledge in order to understand the informants. And he believed that cultural relativism was wrong because it viewed individuals of a given culture as pawns of what observers find to be the rules of a particular culture. Famous French intellectual historian who recently died, Alain Besançon, wrote a review of uh, Devereux's book in 1973, a uh, French edition, the first edition, Ethnopsychiatry. And uh, basically, Devereux returned to Europe. Later, he was invited by Levi Strauss to Europe. In the meantime, he was a psychoanalyst and he ended up as a classical scholar teaching with the best classical scholars at the University of Oxford. So he was classical scholar of the first degree, anthropologist of the first degree, psychoanalyst of the first degree, ethnopsychiatrist of the first degree. Very, very unusual person. And I will just take two of the 13 theorems that Alan Besançon took from ethnopsychoanalysis. In terms of fantasies reported in psychoanalytic literature and then compared with ethnographic data, there were no ethnographically recorded fantasies that could not match a clinically reported fantasy. In other words, psychoanalysts see all the fantasies in their patients that ethnographers see in their research. What exists in one society openly or even in an institutionalized form exists in another society in a state of repression. Let's take a fantasy of the inverted penis. It may appear in one society as psychotic behavior, in another as myth, as belief inferred, and also as the analyzed fantasy of a psychoanalyst. So what is this ethnic psychiatry actually about? It is about the fact that different cultures delineate the unconscious and the conscious differently. So what one culture represses to the unconscious, the other allows to enter the consciousness. And psychoanalysts must be aware of all of it when dealing with patients. As I said, Devereux felt at home only with Mojave Indians. So before he died, he had to make very, very serious preparations in Paris. so that his final wish to be treated as a member of Mojave culture be fully observed. So his ashes were dispersed in Mojave ritual, taken from Paris, taken to America, and dispersed. I will skip uh, the, uh, the work of Norbert Elias. We'll just mention that uh, his book, 
this process, the civilization or the civilizing process from 1939, which was unnoticed, published in Basel, but then became noticed suddenly in the late 1960s and again in the 1980s, confirmed the notion of this Unbehagen in the Kultur, that humans are very much repressed, but restricted them into historical settings of modern Europe. What is more important is that findings from this book were used by Steven Pinker to create his own theory expressed in uh, Better Angels of Our nat Nature, which was actually Steven Pinker's attack to this theory, so-called blank slate theory, or the, the modern denial of human nature, as he called it, in another text. So for this reason, this is another application of Freud. But what happened with Freudianism in um, America? What happened was aptly summarized by Russell Jacobi, who wrote the book The Repression of Psychoanalysis in 1983. And he says that Freudians of the first two generation, generations were cosmopolitan intellectuals, not narrow medical therapists. Compared to recent American analysts, he says, they represent another species. So, Psychoanalysis very much changed in the 1930s due to uh, the penetration of Nazi Germany and its conquerors around Europe. Many intellectuals had to live, particularly those of Jewish origin. And when they came to America, they faced double alterity. First of all, they belonged to the culture of German language, which was totally unpopular in America. And secondly, after 1945, they were also suspected of being leftists, which actually, in most of the cases, they were. So they had to find a way to integrate themselves into American society. And they found the way of conformism, which is, by the way, something that American psychoanalysis already was doing, even before they came. And this means that in America, Psychoanalysis was professionalized. Lay analysis was forbidden, something very important to Freud. It was medicalized. It was defeminized very differently to Freud's original disciples. Masculinized. It was mainstream. It became elitistic. It became accessible only to upper middle class. That was not the case. In interwar Europe, there were many psychoanalysts who were humanists and who were actually doing psychotherapy to anyone, whether they could pay or could not pay, it doesn't matter. It was very different in America. So in 1960, only 7% of American doctors were women, and they were mostly in pediatrics, in psychiatry almost no one. So there is no wonder that feminism and psychoanalysis clashed. For American feminists, Psychoanalysis looked like a male aggressive form of culture, and uh, they called some of the most vocal fem American feminists called psychoanalysts rapists, and Freud included. Uh, fortunately, since the 1970s, there was a gradual shift and feminist defense of psychoanalysis, starting with Juliet Mitchell with mothering theorists, Lacanian theorists, and some queer theorists. So now the two disciplines are fortunately not anymore in such a clash as they had been 40 years ago. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why many anthropologists who use psychoanalysis refrained from mentioning it, like Victor Turner and others. They didn't want to participate in this debate. The other thing that Freud raised was that children are polymorphously perversive in the sexual life of human beings. And in Free Essays of Sexuality, Freud constantly referred to human bisexuality. And finally, in the edition of 1920, he said, it seems to me probable that further research of a similar kind will produce a direct confirmation of this presumption of bisexuality. So, with these kinds of 
points, one would expect that psychoanalysis would be open to anyone, no matter of what he or she would have as preferred sexual orientation. But Freud remained almost alone in psychoanalytical movement in claiming that homosexuality was not a disease, and only Chandra Ferenczi supported him. Freud famously said, yes, you can have therapy to turn homosexual into heterosexual, but it is not more likely to turn homosexual into heterosexual than it is to turn heterosexual into homosexual. In other words, it's almost impossible. He supported even ideas that gay people could be psychoanalysts in his letters to John, uh, Johnson Rank, but Karl Abraham from Berlin was particularly against this since, in his opinion, homosexuals could not be cured from their perversion. And of course, Kraft Ebbing was the first who included homosexuality here in Vienna to one of the four basic perversions. And for Ernest Jones, homosexuality was also a disease. So what happened was that uh, psychoanalysis became hostile to homosexuals and remained so till the 1970s. And Anna Freud played a role in it. Her biographer Elizabeth Rudinesco claims because of her own latent homosexuality, or maybe even more than latent. In the 1960s, unfortunately, and even before and after, many psychoanalysts got themselves involved into conversion therapies that destroyed the lives of many people. Finally, an open gay psychoanalyst appeared. It was Richard Isay. And uh, he wrote this famous book, Being Homosexual, Gay Men and Their Development. And in 1997, American Psychoanalytical Association became the first national mental health organization to support gay marriage. Before American Anthropological Association did the same, it was in 2004. So, huge difference. Freud and his theory is increasingly considered as a precursor or even the beginning of queer theory because this original bisexuality and this polymorphously perversive body of a child actually very, very well resonate with uh, queer theory. And many authors now deal with Freud's idea, not necessarily quoting Freud, of original bisexuality and discuss ambisexual and bisexual basis of human sexuality, including Elizabeth Badinter, James Neal, and Wolfgang Schmale, among others. Nonetheless, to return to psychoanalytic anthropology, Relativism was prevailing, and to mention another psychoanalyst, to come to uh, uh, psychoanalytic anthropologist to come to the 21st century, Wout Kraki, American psychoanalytic anthropologist, had in the 1980s even to defend the idea that individual ideation. Uh, was not an obstacle to understand analyzed culture because many anthropologists like Clifford Gertz and others started to speak that individual ideation is such that it can even prevent understanding or limit understanding of the other culture. So in analyzing Kagwahiv group, Tupigarani linguistic group, Krakia came as an ethnographer. He was not psychologically trained. This is very important. But he came across a member of this group who was speaking with him about his dreams. He took all the notes before he became psychoanalyst, so it's not that his psychoanalytic training conditioned what he wanted to see. Later, when he became psychoanalyst, he took those notes to analyze them and see what's there. And what you see there are actually very similar concepts to what Freud was talking about, castration complex and other things. So his conclusion was that cultural difference is not an insuperable obstacle to communication and to the understanding of psych psychological states in another person. After him, there was one of these small turning points in the history of anthropology, 
and this was the publication of this book, Human Universals by Donald Brown. What are human universals? Well, Donald Brown says human universals, of which hundreds have been identified, consist of those features of culture, society, language, behavior, and mind that so far as the record has been examined are found among all peoples known to ethnography and history. And he provided six case studies. Of the his six case studies included three deal with psychoanalysis. One is the Oedipus complex, the other is uh, repression of, or non-repression of sexuality in Samoan, uh, among Samoans. And the third one is about another group that Margaret Mead described Chimbulis, and this is reinterpretation of that group. Steven Pinker later took all these universals, made a list, and among those 400 universals and many more near universals, there are a lot of universals that actually psychoanalysis claim to be universal. All the people have dreams dream interpretation, emotions, envy, taboo offenses between mother and son, Oedipus complex, psychological defense mechanisms, symbolism, taboos, etc. So this was the contribution of Donald Brown, which reopened the whole question. But the main attack did not come from only from anthropologists, it came from post-colonial critic, and I come to the third part of my presentation, which is how does psychoanalysis work in the post-colonial world? And there is increasing number, very, very rich literature talking about all of this. And I have taken two examples here. Uh, one is India, that was under the British colonial rule, and the other is Iran or Persia that was never a colony, but was subjected to colonial zones of influence. And starting with India, Indian psychoanalysis began only slightly later than in Budapest. In 1922, the Psychoanalytical Society of Calcutta was founded by Girindra Sekhar Bose, who was one of only three psychoanalysts who were allowed to be psychoanalysts, although no one analyzed them. Only Freud, Bose, and Eichhorn analyzed themselves. He influenced some major Indian scholars, but his activities made a small effect, simply because after the independence of India, there was some skepticism about psychoanalysis. Today, there are three schools of Indian psychoanalysis, Ericksonian, which insists on culture, and it's personified by psychoanalyst and influential thinker Sadir Kakar, and by leading Indian intellectual Ashish Nandi, who wrote this book, Savage Freud. There is also Kleinian School, which is mother-centered in Mumbai, and there are prominent American Indian psychoanalysts like Salman Akhtar. You could see his edited books in the previous slide. But there is also criticism of classical psychoanalysis and Marxism as forms of Eurocentrism coming from Nandi, and that one is probably the most penetrating. But I will here concentrate on Sadir Kakar, who was called by Novel Observateur, one of the 25 most influential thinkers in the world. He experienced estrangement at the Sigmund Freud, famous Sigmund Freud Institute in Frankfurt, and it led him, where he had stipend, and it led him to contemplate about the self. He realized that psychoanalysts were, in his words, as much cove in their cultural unconscious as their clients. Following Ericksonian model, he included cultural dimensions to psychoanalysis. Kakar is not a relativist for him, there are cultural universals we all share as human beings, but equally there are large parts of our mental life that are cultural. He rejects radical cultural relativism and warns that in attuning our modern eyes to SP divergence and variations, anthropology may have undermined our ability to recognize resemblances. And now I will try to ask you something you all know about, of course, we all know about Mozart or Beethoven or Verdi, but can anyone here tell me 
one author of classical author of Hindustani classical music. But you see, that's the genre that enjoys today the same audience like Western music. So, living in Frankfurt, Sadir Kakar experienced the following. He says to me at that time, speaking of the 1970s, Beethoven was just so much noise. While I doubt if my analyst even knew of the existence of Hindustani classical music, which so moved me. You see here one example of Hindustani classical music. I didn't know anything about it, but you had to Google it. But as you know, here in Vienna is Beethoven's Frieze which appeared, which was made by Klim just two years after Freud's interpretation of dreams. And it ends with this message, this kiss to the whole world, a line from Beethoven's mind. And the way how we understand Beethoven is that he's universal. And if you go to the House of Secession, you will get uh, various technical devices to listen to Beethoven's universal music, but it's not necessarily universal to everyone. That is what uh, Sadir Kakar wanted to warn us about. And to give another example, and final example, of meeting double authority in hostile internal world by Gohar Homayumpur, Iranian psychoanalyst, she says that her story is a story in which analyst and analysant have the courage to face the chaos of their unconscious, to come face to face with the stranger in themselves, and to learn to bear the anxiety of participating in the unknown. This very much sounds like Georges Devereaux, just a little bit reworked. And she, of course, follows Julia Kristeva, another feminist psychoanalyst, which also speaks about this uh, uh, fusion of the two disciplines that fortunately happened. And there is Kristeva's concept of worrying strangeness, or as Kristeva puts it, the fear of the other and the worry of strangeness are both the results of the fear of the difference of the other within ourselves. So essentially, psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic anthropology, they reach the point very similar to anthropology. Anthropology is supposed to discover the other, but psychoanalysis now in modern incarnation warns us that there are two others, both the therapist and the analysant are others for the therapist himself or herself, because therapist has other in himself or herself, plus other as his patient, and we come back to Devereaux and his notions of fantasies and anxieties. But what happened to her, she developed in Tehran her discipline, and importantly, she works in a private practice with middle-class patients, but she also works in public state hospital where lorry drivers and others come. And she says, and she described it in this book, Doing Psych Psychoanalysis in Tehran, she described case by case. And you see the Turk patients experience very similar experiences like Freud's patients in 1900. And she's a Boston-trained psychoanalyst. So she came to Paris to speak about that. And what did she face in Paris? She faced strangeness. Lacanian psychoanalysts, who are supposed to be the most progressive, told her, no, no, this is impossible. You can't do psychoanalysis in Tehran. Iranians cannot free associate. They are very different from us. So obviously, the story is still not over. And, but importantly, uh, Judith Butler wrote uh, endorsement to the second book, which only testifies to these new encounters of psychoanalysis and anthropology. And, to finish with what psycho, where psychoanalysis is now today. International Psychoanalytic Association now has a group, Geographies of Psychoanalysis, which actually shows how much uh, psychoanalysis, to a certain degree, relativized this idea of uh, universal human nature, keeping 
at the same time its core. So the chairperson of this group says, it is no longer a question of dialogue with other disciplines, but one of establishing a comparison between different anthropological positions. We have to understand whether psychoanalytical concepts are universal and if its therapeutical methodology is effective in different countries worldwide. We are not taking, we are not talking about adopting relativism, which instead of favoring contact, isolates every thought and culture in its own particular dimension, but making anthropological models dynamic, including those in the Western world where psychoanalysis was born, and then put them in contact with others with their respective problem areas of the present day. And to conclude, alterity is now the meeting ground of psychoanalysis and anthropology. If we accept that we have double other, other in ourselves and other that we need to uh, analyze, whether in psychoanalysis or anthropology, all the same, then if we add to that relativism, we come to a very strange position we come to a position that we cannot understand others. But if other is also in ourselves, and if due to relativism it, we cannot understand it, it means that we cannot understand us, not only the other culture. And that is the problem of uh, where relativism, radical relativism could bring us. Or as Marc Auger said, who recently died, a famous French anthropologist, let us bear in mind that individual, as well as individual and collective cultures, get constructed through confrontation and negotiation with alterity. This being, by the way, the meaning of ritual activity. If we were to insist only on the exterior of symbolic meaning, any understanding of the complexity of the identity alterity nexus gets necessarily limited. And by limiting our understanding, we further weaken or rapture the nexus and thus end up threatening both forms of existence. In other words, we also have to understand the interior of symbolic meaning, and that is the common ground where psychoanalysis and anthropology have met, currently at the stage where both disciplines have huge self-doubts about themselves, and when it is very questionable how they are going to be further developed, but they have met in this field of alterity, but obviously psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic anthropology has a lot to offer to anthropology, and anthropology has a lot to offer to psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic anthropology. Thank you very much. and thank you very much for taking us on this whirlwind tour, uh, intellectual and historical, of Eurocentrism and also in the world that we are today. So there's so much to discuss. I will uh, forego the uh, privilege of the moderator and open it up straight away to our audience because we have about 15 to 20 minutes before we go down for the post-lecture period. So please uh, comment, uh, Franz, and do introduce yourselves for our live audience. <coughs> Hi, uh, I'm Franz. I'm fellows program coordinator at the IWM and also social anthropologist. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for this amazing lecture. I'm very impressed about this to the force on anthropology psychoanalysis. Great. Um, I've, I've got many questions. I hope I can formulate at least one, one, one or two. Um, well, maybe start with the one that moves me most, which is probably just a question of understanding for you regarding your last point on, on authority. Maybe you could just give two or three additional sentences where you see that there's that the internexus between anthropology and psychoanalysis could play out in actual current fieldwork 
done, and you know I don't want to limit it to the topics of the IWM, but obviously democracy and populism, and this is currently very very moving. So where would you see the the grip f f f f for that? And the second question, which is probably bo more theoretical, but um, you know when when I was taught at the anthropology department at in Vienna, there was this kind of paradigm, the universalia humana et cultura, and and you know it really gave us big insights into how that played out in psychoanalysis and anthropology. But where do you see, you know, that how does the ontological turn, so to say, or the re revisiting these questions of nature and culture plays uh, into this probably nexus of alterity in itself. Okay, starting with other, I think that uh, people increasingly read Devereaux again. I see particularly in, uh, among German scholars, actually. He was a rare... Uh, anthropologist who actually left Mark in Germany, in France, in, in the United States. He had fast shrift in German, also in English, an institute in center in Paris, he has his name. And when he spoke about fantasies and anxiety, that was the beginning, but gradually Psychoanalysis has been very much focused on this fact that at the age of six months, child passes from pre-objective to objective world. And depending on psychoanalysts, some think that this is a very traumatic experience, uh, which actually leads to what we understand as strange, as other, etc. These new interpretations actually point out that we have strangers all the time in ourselves and have to deal with it. So, something that Devereaux also spoke about. So, how does it work with populism and anything? Well, it works that every single scholar should be aware, should be self-reflexive about possible anxieties, fears, and other things that he or she has before approaching certain subject. This is, by the way, very much in this book by the Iranian psychoanalyst that I quoted. Psychoanalyst meets this problem every single day in his or her psychoanalytic work. Every single day, psychoanalyst must fight with himself and herself of not projecting himself or herself into patients, something that psychoanalysis was very much accused of in the past. So uh, why is this a meeting point? Because anthropologists are not equipped to deal with dynamic psychiatry, to put it that way. It doesn't need to be psychoanalysis. I am using the term of Henry Ellenberger dynamic psychiatry can be some other uh, discipline. This is where any form of dynamic psychiatry can help an, in an ethnographer, and of course ethnographer in today's world would rather be someone investigating how MPs behave in European Parliament than someone going to Amazon. Uh, nonetheless, these things are at stake. Speaking of universalism, I, I basically cannot add anything to what Fromm said. Both things have their limits, fixed nature and no human nature at all. If nature is fixed, it's clear it will be used for political purposes, usually conservative, but not necessarily conservative. If there is no human nature, we have a problem. Is communication possible? How far is it limited? But if psyche, as Lacan suggested, uh, is very similar to the structure of language, then if we can learn language of any other group, that by itself means that we can communicate with that culture. 
So it's not that really. I think that uh, uh, differences were overemphasized. And what Brown did, Brown didn't speak about uh, fixed nature because this number of universals is relatively small. But what was happening in anthropology for years was something that was called bongo bongoism, as you know. So uh, ethnologists, one ethnologist can say, among uh, hunters and gatherers, hunters are always men and gatherers are always women. But then you say, no, there is one tribe in the Philippines called Akta where women may, uh, may hunt. Indeed, there is. So, Brown would now call it near universal and not universal. Uh, there is no you know, s substantial difference between the two things because some very specific local adaptation may lead to near universals. And um, in that sense, uh, also what Sadir Kakar raised, a lot of things, those things that he raised are very much connected to Indian culture. But a lot of things that he raised actually exist in European cultures as well. He raised this question that in Indian culture, why psychoanalysis cannot be taken word by word, that in Indian culture it's more mother-oriented and in terms of symbolic world, more women-oriented culture than European. But Anna Parsons, the daughter of Talcott Parsons, she was working with Southern Italians and she noticed that Madonna is there, the main deity. So it's very diff similar to what Sadir Kakar writes about um, India. And also Sadir Kakar insists that Freud made a mistake by and Freudians by insisting that art was so important that they overvalued art, while in some non-European cultures, religion is valued more than art. But that's because Sadir Kakar is interested very much in religion and because he writes about mysticism. So we all uh, unavoidably bring ourselves into the objects of our investigations and cannot escape that. So that awareness is very important. And this is what uh, geographies of psychoanalysis have uh, initiated to try to be aware of it. I think that is the possible mode of cooperation between psychoanalysis and anthropology. Obviously, it already works. Questions, comments? Liz. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, my question is kind of about just broadly what your project is here. And I was, so if it's partially, you're telling a history of the relationship between these two disciplines that themselves make a, essentializing claims, but in some way you're, you're historicizing their essentialism in, in this project. Um, and I want, so if that's what's going on, I wanted to ask about some just what their relationship was to other ideas that were that like uh, in this era of sort of a proliferation of theories about otherness that are also biological and eugenicist and there, there's other sciences floating around that are doing things at that time and whether the whether part of their drive to say actually we can see the western human or what we think is the human that we've decided in the west is the human we can see it everywhere is that in some way a reaction to racist essentializing sciences that are also happening at that time that's my history question and then if you're not actually doing a history if you're saying like we're going to figure out the right theory then how do you explain the history in psychoanalytic terms does that make sense like what's the psychoanalytic concept for what happened in the history <coughs> okay i obviously have been writing an introduction to psychoanalytic anthropology, which will include methods of uh, intellectual history and methods, and of course, the main findings of psychoanalytic anthropology and its uh, interconnections with ant general anthropology. Uh, I said at some point that 
when in intellectual history uh, historians establish that some idea came out under certain uh, conditions, it does not speak about the validity or non-validity of that theory. It just contextualizes this theory, that's all. So that, of course, is something that an intellectual historian has to do, but he does not provide explanation by it. However, all these intellectual historians also had points, for instance, on in human nature, like Peter, not all, but Peter Gay definitely did. He was, uh, as, of course, someone who was writing about enlightenment and was close to the ideas of enlightenment, he was also close to Hume's and others' ideas. Uh, so essentially, it's a combination of uh, two or three approaches that, that should explain it. Freud could also be understood, and Fromm understood him that way, as an instinct instinctivist, but not everyone understood it. And interpretations of Freud are so different and so opposite that, um, uh, you know, you could you have encyclopedias of Freud, actually, in several volumes, explaining all these different Freuds. And if you read Marcuse and Fromm, that's enough. It is so opposite, as if they spoke about two men who never met, mutually, or perhaps didn't even live in the same age. So this is what complicates uh, this interpretation. So in intellectual history, uh, what I add always, uh, uh, what, uh, for instance, Marcuse did not care that much about, if we have 10,000 letters of Freud, and we do have, we can really follow the development ideas. We can really not only say what we think Freud said, but we can at least quote what Freud thought he said to his disciples. Of course, as you know, in literary criticism, some people who do literary criticism claim that literary critics understand writers better than writers themselves. So if you take that position, that can lead you further. So basically, there are different schools of intellectual history. And um, uh, as I said, I am the most impressed with these results of American uh, scholarship uh, about Freud in terms of intellectual history, especially Peter Gay, Karl Schorske, William McGrath, and one brilliant historian who wrote the book, The Austrian Mind, William M. Johnston. Uh, but uh, this other thing, psychoanalytic anthropology, first of all, I don't think it's too widely known. It's you know, mentioned maybe in footnotes or elsewhere. There is one book on that, uh, a rather old one, so I think it could be uh, raised again. And uh, uh, in what I will add in this book, this is this post-colonial criticism. And uh, of course, uh, it's very valuable, and uh, I, I, don't, I can't answer that question whether there, are, there is universal human nature or there is not. I just say that I personally, emotionally, and as Deborah said, we have to be faced with our own anxieties, I personally, emotionally uh, feel as the closest interpretation to my own what Fromm said, that uh, both extremes have their very serious limits. Anyone else? I'm a psychologist and I also studied history. And my first experience with uh, other people in psychology was when I worked at the psychiatry clinic in Vienna. And it was very interesting to experience that uh, tests that we made with Europeans and with, for instance, Arabs, brought completely different results. And you could not talk to Arabs or Africans in the same way as you talk to Austrians or Germans. And in history, I when I studied, structuralism was very, in the uh, was the structuralist turn in history, that the surrounding makes the people. 
That means people who live in a fertile country have different psychologies and different histories than people who live in an arid uh, surrounding. And I think, could it not be that we do not know what all is in our psychic potential? And different cultures trigger different behaviors and different feelings. It may be that we all have passions, we have, we laugh, we fight, but that what triggers the, the passions and what triggers the fight depends on the culture. And the culture depends on, thing, on very, um, very much other things. And psych uh, uh, psychoanalysis is just one concept of psychology. Devereaux would totally agree with you that each culture triggers different responses. That's why he made that in psychiatry, so that, that goes without saying. I think psychoanalysts have realized that, and that's why Sadir Kakar had it, says that he had to adopt psychoanalysis to local Indian uh, conditions where you have extended family, so you cannot really think in the same way as you would think about that in Vienna. So, absolutely, yes, different... Uh, uh, do and of course uh, that's why I said that the uh, space is open for um, the cooperation between what we could call dynamic psychiatry and uh, anthropology, not only psychoanalysis, of course. And uh, uh, but you know, if uh, I would try to write a book on on the relations between dynamic psychiatry, so various schools, and uh, anthropology, I don't think my lifetime would be enough to, to cover the subject. It's simply so, so big, and it is enough to quote uh, uh, Marvin Harris, uh, the author of Cannibals and Kings, once very famous book, who said that uh, the history of cultural and personality school, which you wouldn't really associate with psychoanalysis, rather as opponent to psychoanalysis, but he says that it's essentially discussion between Boz and Freud. Uh, so, uh, uh, simply psychoanalysis was there, and uh, it's, to return to my first slide, the 20th century was the century of self, so no other person, and that's what William M. Johnston also says, no other person influenced so much the century as Sigmund Freud did. And in that sense, it's perhaps worthy of analyzing how these two concepts interacted, clashed, and whether they can be reconciled at some point. Uh, these two uh, disciplines. Uh, but. Of course, I agree with you, so yes, there are many other schools, and absolutely every cultural setting triggers different responses, uh, which in Devereux's interpretation does not mean that there is no human nature, but it means that uh, different cultures uh, delineate what, re what should be repressed and what should not be repressed differently, and exactly because they do it differently, they trigger different responses, and different responses trigger, again, different anxieties and fantasies. Okay, <coughs> so um, let's slowly bring this to a close, and I cannot resist um, a, if you allow me, a, a small autobiographical note, and that is that my professor and someone whom you knew, uh, Professor Zagorka Golubovic, was member of the Praxis Group of Philosophers. She had uh, an MA course at the University of Belgrade at the Faculty of Philosophy called Interdisciplinary Course of Anthropology. And uh, she had us read all of the things that you mentioned in the first part, Malinowski, Margaret Mead, Eric Fromm, Sigmund Freud. So there we, we had this understanding that things were, to put it very colloquially, more complex than they seemed through the eyes of the individual 
authors. And so what I'm saying is that the work, the very erudite work that you have been uh, pursuing over all these years uh, on Freud, but more broadly, I think are, are a serious contribution to understanding what in geopolitical terms we call a multipolar world here in intellectual terms and again self-referentially as a member of the 68 generation where things really exploded and, o and opened up in terms of environment of feminism of anti-psychiatry of you name it really have uh, or, or you know just to throw out uh, um, uh, Deleuze's and Guattari's book on anti-Oedipus uh, and, uh, you know, or we published, for example, to go back into history, Bartolome de las Casas, who, you know, was a missionary and was with the conquistadores in Latin America and said, wait a minute, these people are like us. They're not savages or primitives. I see in them human beings. So there are earlier uh, attempts to show that, you know, again, whether we take the Fromm's point of view or other, there's something that is common to us, whether we live in Amazonian forests or in uh, urban urban capitals. So this is a little um, uh, rambling uh, for, for the conclusion of this. But thank you very much, Slobodan. Please join me in thanking Slobodan for his lecture. And please join.